Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, our meeting is dedicated to the question of value of, di of digital art and how to appraise it. And um, it runs in the framework of uh, the exhibition pending uh, futures and um, Kadaf Online uh, Digital Art Fair, uh, which runs between 17th and 23rd of uh, June. Uh, Pending uh, Futures is a group uh, project that unites young artists, the students of leading uh, Dutch and uh, Russian art institutions who work with digital media. And uh, it um, uh, sets up a question of uh, can uh, digital space be a safe space uh, in the light of COVID-19? Uh, and also its research part deals with uh, a question of how uh, contemporary art uh, education introduces digital media into their curriculum. And today we have um, our honored experts from various fields of contemporary art. Uh, to touch this sensitive uh, question, which, which bothers not only artists, but also curators, uh, collectors, and the art lovers. And uh, I want to introduce uh, you, Anastasia Glebova, the CEO and uh, co-founder of VART, a platform for exhibit and sell and collecting of uh, digital art. Uh, Anastasia. Wave us. <laughs> Hi, Anna. Good afternoon to everybody. I'm glad Hello. to join today's company and talk about my favorite topic, which is namely the value of digital art. Yeah. I feel that this topic is a bit underrepresented nowadays, both in media, sure. the professional mm -hmm. sector, and of course, in the mass uh, uh, social networks. So glad that you have chosen it for today's talk. Absolutely. And um, uh, one of our speakers is Sylvain Levy, a collector and uh, one of the principals of DSL Collection. Uh, thank you, Sylvain, for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> That's our pleasure. And um, Alexandra Artamonovskaya, uh, the uh, head of partnership uh, at Dot Art, the art world's uh, main domain. Uh, we are happy to be hosted uh, Art Catch uh, online gallery on uh, on art domain. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And uh, Arseni Vesnin, founder of Design Collector Network, which has been uh, running since uh, 2003. And Arseni is also uh, editor to uh, Super Rare uh, NFT platform. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for invitation. Let's do it. Yeah, let's uh, let's start with uh, Anastasia uh, because um, our exhibition pending uh, uh, futures is uh, created on as a virtual exhibition on your uh, VR platform, and I know that you guys also participate in uh, Cutoff Online as exhibitors. So. Could you start, please, with telling us what's the uh, uh, background of the art platform and uh, what is it, uh, what the kind of mission it has at the moment? Yeah, sure. So that's a um, great coincidence that today we have three exhibitors at once on, on the talk. So it was uh, Yana, Alexandra, and uh, me as a representative of the VR platform. And yeah, as, as Yana has already mentioned, we are glad to host uh, the Pending Futures exhibition on the VR. So don't forget also to join it for the opening on 15th of June. Mm -hmm. um, you will be there or see it later on the VR website, of course, on the application too. Uh, so it started all uh, in the beginning of 2020, so already almost one mm -hmm. and a half year ago, uh, when uh, both me and my colleagues gathered to uh, actually discuss some ideas. We were already working in the sphere of cultural projects. So I have personally five years in cultural management, both as a lawyer, as a PM, and mm -hmm. as a financial yeah. specialist, so in different roles. Uh, I personally have a legal and, and economic background, so I came not from traditional artistic perspective uh, to the business. Uh, so over the years of my, and especially some biggest projects which I was yeah. supporting as a PM, uh, which were dealing with virtual reality art, especially, and art also physical one in general, uh, we have collected many stories, especially from artists and collectors that they 
do not know how to digitalize their art. They do not know how to protect IP rights in that sphere. So uh, like the main question, which which I have heard so many times, like, am I buying just a file? So that, that was how the market was up to 2020 mm -hmm. and even up to this year, uh, I can say in the majority of it. Uh, that's how the idea of VRT came to us because one of our co-founders, Robad Mini, he's also a pioneer in digital artist. So he's already doing digital art for over over 10 years and has a big background also in kind of mixed reality art. Uh, and so we were selected into American Business Incubator and that's how we came up with the idea to create a transparent infrastructure for the digital art. And that's how it turned to VR, an online platform to exhibit, sell, and collect digital art. So we have went through various steps because we have started exactly before the pandemic. And of course, the pandemic situation shaped a lot of uh, what we have been dealing with. Uh, and we started with a big research, especially in the sphere of collectors, galleries, and museums, of course, artists, and found out what are the main pain points and mm -hmm. made it private. Uh, so we created a virtual exhibition tech, which is now so uh, good to be hosting the exhibitions in the virtual format, both on the 3D and VR or AR, depends on the format of exhibition. And now our mission sounds as a new way to reconcile cultural and commercial value of digital art. Uh, we are about to launch the marketplace function on our platform. So it's expected in less than a month and it will be an NFT plus in terms of uniting uh, the blockchain solutions and of course the legal and technical part for supporting uh, digital art both in the format of the file and in the format of the non-fungible token. Yeah, I would, uh, I would uh, want, I would like to uh, look at it a bit uh, more closely but um, uh, regarding uh, virtual exhibitions, um, me and uh, Anastasia recently we were members of the jury of one of the art uh, management courses at their uh, diploma presentations and one of the students whose project was uh, launching a virtual exhibition platform, he mentioned uh, that uh, the uh, installation of uh, online exhibition is way much easier than offline ones and uh, Anastasia I want you to demystify, uh, demystify a bit, uh, this statement what are the main uh, challenges of uh, dealing with uh, virtual art exhibitions because for many people it uh, really seems something really uh, very easy is just a file uh, and uh, you just connect it somewhere and the dam, the exhibition is ready. So, is it so? Uh, yeah, thanks for raising this topic. It's a pretty popular myth that digital art in general is easier than physical art. So I, I'm really glad that it's now already kind of diminishes from the from the mass media and from the public sphere in general. So when it comes to the digital formats, the main thing is, of course, uh, to know how to keep the attention of the viewer. So which means that in the digital, uh, we uh, have to get more sources of information than just the visual part. So in the digital, you also have to uh, be careful with the descriptions because if uh, the description of your exhibition does not catch your imagination already from the first uh, time, it means that maybe the viewer will not give it a second try. Uh, secondly, of course, it's the technical parts that uh, as many of you also have experienced if if it was a page or the application does not uh, load like 10, 15, 20 seconds, you're already becoming a bit mad. And first digital exhibition solutions were actually pretty slow. And that's what also turns the audience a bit off uh, from them. Uh, so now it's also important to look at the quality and at the technical uh, kind of compatibility of the platform you are using or the team who will be creating a kind of customized solution for your website uh, in terms of how it looks, how it works, first of all, both on the mobile, on the iPad, and of course on the PC, because uh, in my personal point, uh, it's now already a standard that any viewer from all over the world, no matter whether they have a the last MacBook or maybe just, you know, a 10 year computer, they should be able to access the exhibition and enjoy the digital arts uh, in its original format. 
And thirdly, it's of course, uh, maybe the main struggle is here for the curators and for the people who are organizing and placing the artworks. Uh, that's what we have also experienced in the pending future exhibitions, that you cannot see from the start what will be the outcome, especially if it's one of your first times when you're working with digital exhibition in general, or maybe exactly with this type of the new format you want to try. So here you have to be in a good contact with, uh, with the team uh, who is working on, on the technical part of your solution and uh, kind of imagine it the way it's possible. Because one of, one of the main questions, which my technical team hears a lot from, from the exhibitions we are working with is, is it possible? Is that possible? And in the virtual, like almost everything is possible. And that's the main challenge here to, uh, to understand what you want to achieve. Yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, and uh, could you remind, please, uh, how the exhibitions can be accessed? It's the web version uh, application you mentioned. Uh, oh. Yes. Yeah, so in our case, we have, the, we have started initially with a mobile app. Mm -hmm. uh, main reason why, because we are also using the augmented reality function and it's generally works uh, better when you have a mobile application than if you're using the web version and especially if you're using your personal computer. So it's mostly a mobile solution. And secondly, exactly in 2020, uh, the usage of mobile, mobile applications in general uh, was rising a lot, especially in the sphere of online art. So not only with digital, but with online. And according to Hiscox's online art report, it was almost 40 to 50% of even all the sales went through mobile. So for us, it was mm -hmm. a pretty, uh, easy, kind of a pretty, mm -hmm legit solution to start with a mobile application as a way to showcase art and kind of puts a gallery into the pocket of the viewer. So now the application, the VR app has uh, users from 62 countries and we are, we are really happy that uh, it is so already mm -hmm. uh, kind of spread worldwide and people from all over the world can access exhibitions. And uh, just a, a bit more than a month ago, we have also launched the web version so now you can also access the exhibition from your computer and in, in the web version you can generally uh, see more information at the same time so if you are more into reading than watching that's your mm -hmm. option okay but uh, so uh since uh 2020 you have a uh, quite impression um, impressive record of uh exhibitions uh, uh of digital and of also fidgetal art yeah and um do you have already some statistics uh, which uh, exhibitions are better uh, perceive, uh, perceived by the public, uh, which receive more attention? And um, is there any average portrait of the visitors uh, in terms of uh, um, their age, uh, geography, any, any statistics about that? Yes, yeah, so we are permanently working on the analytics, not only from our platform and our audience, but of course on the digital art market in general. And I can say that there is no, you know, one, you do not have one portrait of your target audience. So it depends no. on every position. So the person who likes that digital art, so digitalized physical art uh, can be more, uh, can be more active. Like, there are some, I cannot say that it's already a statistics, I mean, like that you can see a certain relation between them, uh, but uh, our main audience is in terms of age located between 24 and 35. Mm -hmm. And uh, geogra in terms of geographics, it's mostly the USA, China, and UAE now. Oh, interesting. Nice. And um, you know, we're working with the artists on this uh, exhibition. Um, I, we discussed uh, just general questions um, because they are young artists, they're students and they only enter uh, the art scene. And uh, for many of them, uh, the question is how to price their works and uh, um, what uh, should they make it in additions or unique piece. And um, you mentioned that you're establishing a trade uh, platform. And um, do you have any idea of any fair price, uh, existing a fair price uh, for digital art? Uh, which strategies of pricing uh, could be used in this case? Uh, so now we are working on index of value, which will kind of 
help additionally to find whether the price was appropriate uh, also in terms of the market uh, situation with every artwork. But I mean, it's not, it's always not the last resort and uh, it's kind of a tool to see the dynamics of the development of each artwork, of the, each artist. Uh, and in general, I can say that there is no term as fair price maybe mm -hmm. in, in any sphere, not only on the, on the art market. And we are also pretty often approached uh, regarding the price, which is to set, how is it better? So uh, yeah. should I should I start with a hundred copies or should I sell only exclusively? And I feel that there is never one strategy that can be, that can work for you all the time. Mm -hmm. Because of course we have a phenomenon as, as, as a people case, which, which is now 25% of the whole uh, NFT part of the digital art markets. And of course that's, that's a great case, but it does not mean that uh, this strategy can work for you uh, as well as an artist. Mm -hmm. So I feel that here you have to find your uh, own approach and always uh, know this is a parallel between the, the art market, so I mean the global art market, which was evolving mm -hmm. already for centuries, and that some behavior, that the behavior of the art collectors does not change so drastically, no matter whether it's physical art or digital, and there are lots of things to be compared. And first of all is, of course, the scarcity of the artworks, that if you are selling simultaneously all the art which you have been creating for the last 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, collector can see everything and there is no scarcity and no kind of selection of what you are placing mm -hmm. and uh, yeah so log basically it means that uh, the general price mechanism works here and uh you can sell for for a less for a less you know monetary value of the artwork mm -hmm. uh so i feel that here it's important to think of your strategy in, in the long-term point and maybe the main thing here is that it's not presented so widely in the physical art market but works in digital more is your social media audience especially whether you are active on twitter or any other platform so whether you are active on discord and communicating with collectors or whether you are active on on instagram if you are it's not the main platform of course for yeah. nft part of the digital art market but in general in terms of audience that's important and again the people is a great case while Trevor Jones, so the third most selling artist uh, in the NFT part of the market, is not so active on Instagram. So here we see again that there are no 100% uh, relation between uh, anything you do. And I feel that if as an artist you want to experiment, now it's kind of one of the best times to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have seen uh, personally many artists who try various platforms to find what works for them best. And it can be also a good strategy. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I think yes, uh, because it's uh, uh, for many it's a new market and uh, uh, making some research and uh, comparisons is a very good point for the artists as well as uh, active activeness in uh, social media and scarcity. I agree that uh, I do not advise uh, the uh, artists to make uh, huge editions uh, of their works uh, and also as you mentioned to place everything they ever created uh, on the market all kinds of work just pick, pick up the best uh, pieces and um, another problem that we faced uh, in working uh, with the artists actually with only one um, I'm very grateful to the artists for their trust and cooperation but uh, we had an issue that um, one of the artists he was really very much concerned about the safety and uh, copyright of his uh, artwork uh, given it for the online exhibition actually the file the digital file so how um, how is it um, how does uh, can the safety be um, ensured in this case because the online exhibition is a uh, becoming a really pretty normal thing and uh, but at the same time not uh, all the artists want yet deal with any nft uh, format uh, some find it uh, a little bit still uh, they are cautious uh, some find the process of uh, tokenization of their art pieces a little bit complicated and uh, so they try would rather stay aside and watch and observe. Um, so how is it in this case? 
yeah, I'm always glad to hear as an artist I became becoming more and more aware of, of the legal part of what they are doing, yeah. especially with, uh, with the intellectual property and copyright as a part of it in general. So one main thing here is before you upload anything, please read uh, the terms and conditions of the platform. Mm -hmm. Because many platforms, especially if there is new ones that popped up like week, two weeks ago or something like that, uh, they have a general uh, thing there that you are providing them with a permanent license to showcase your artwork, which means that you cannot even like, if you will want to withdraw your art, you already gave them a permanent license. So please take care of it, especially if you are working with a new platform and you do not have any kind of use cases yet with it. Or um, so that's always works this way. Read the terms and conditions firstly. Uh, second part here is that you should be uh, well aware of whether your file is, how it is stored. So one of the main technical solutions which I use now for NFT platforms, of course, IPFS, so which stands for Interplanetary File System. Um, of course, it's not, like, it's one of the best what, what is yet on the market, but I have already heard from about also the new technical solutions and we are working on that too, because in case, uh, because the token is actually bounded via the link to the file. And in case the file is deleted or was not, you know, also uploaded uh, properly, which can um, especially help uh, happen if it's an open platform. So there is no selection and also no responsibility for storage in the files. And it means that the, art, the artist could have given a link to the Google Drive. So mm -hmm. the artwork deleted, goes somewhere, and I've already heard of such cases. I mean, especially if it's an, a non-curated platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have a void token because it, the link leads to nowhere. So that's also important to think about storage in your artwork, especially if you work with the open platforms where you are the one who is responsible for providing the links. Uh, same goes for selling digital art as a file. If you are given it via the link and in the document you have mm -hmm. in the contract which you are signing with the buyer, you have the link, please take care that this link is secure. Uh, so that's the second point here. And the third one is, especially if you are doing a digital exhibition, uh, please gather all your files and always ask for, um, for the documents, the license especially if you are not working with something which has, you know, a standard terms and conditions for everything which you are automatically uploading. So usually uh, the license should be tailored exactly to the file you're providing. So it will be a bit different for a uh, digital exhibition if it's, you know, for, for example, located in one country. And I had an interesting case a couple of weeks ago. I was asked why, why is it mentioned in the license that uh, the license is given to an unlimited territory, so for all over the world, if it's just a platform. Okay, so platform operates globally, which means that yeah. you have to give a license to every country. You cannot limit it, for instance, to Europe or to Northern America. It means that the users from other countries will not access. So uh, I can also recommend maybe given it like an hour, maybe two, and get a bit more educated in terms of the intellectual properties, the main concepts of it. Mm -hmm. uh, because buying an NFT is pretty close to buying a physical artwork when it, com when it comes to the rights. So when you are buying, a, and if you know already, if I can sell a standard NFT, you're not getting any additional rights to use it commercially or to reproduce it in any other way. So please uh, watch carefully what you are buying and if you are, part of the buyer and you feel that, oh, I have a file, I can, you know, print a t-shirt with it. No, you can't because you were not buying the rights for it. So this kind of goes both ways. And I feel that there is kind of the education and the sphere, I mean, in the legal part, especially with the NFT is lacking a bit. Uh, but every time I hear that somebody calls themselves an NFT lawyer, it's, it's too early to say that uh, there are already you know, super professionals in that sphere. Mm -hmm. And, um, Look at what you are what you are signing for is maybe the easiest and the main uh, point to highlight now. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Anastasia. I wanted to um, continue with uh, talking about virtual uh, exhibitions and um, uh, Silvan. I know that you have you also virtual museum, but uh, before we get to this point, I wanted to. 
just to tell about your collection because you uh, and your wife Dominique you've been collecting already for 25 years and uh, I've read that you started with uh, uh, your first interest was lying in the field of uh, European uh, contemporary art and design and since 2005 uh, you uh, have be, have become one of the biggest uh, collectors of Chinese contemporary art in Europe and now you, um, you also are interested in digital art. Can you tell about uh, this, uh, this new passion, if it's new, and how it was born? Uh, first, uh, we haven't been collecting for 25 years, but for 37 years. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, I've already as, sounded quite uh, serious. Uh, you know, uh, as soon as we get married, uh, we decided to collect. And if I can give you a secret between you and me, collecting as a couple, you learn the art of compromise and you're still married 37 years after. So I encourage people to collect as a couple. Uh, this is my first, you know, uh, uh, my You're first uh, <laughs> uh, my, about art. I think it's a, it, it's a valuable, uh, I shall say, it's a very, very valuable fruit of collecting as a couple. The other thing which I would like to, uh, to add to what you said is, uh, is the way uh, we, we went to, uh, to digital. I think that uh, what is important for us is not the technology. Once again, we look at the society. We try to speak the language of our time. And we, when we decided to, to make this Chinese collection, first, why the Chinese collection? Because we happened, we, we made a, first we collected contemporary art and we went to design for 25 years. Then we happened to go to China. And uh, we came back and we said, wow, well, you know, art is a mirror of a society. And we wanted to find the energy that we were experiencing in China because of this transformation of this country in terms of speed and scale. So we said, let's go to, uh, uh, to make a, a, a collection, only focus on Chinese contemporary art. The other way, the other question that we ask ourselves is that, are we going to open the collection to the public or to keep it close as we used to do? Once again, I respect people who close the collection for themselves. I think a collection is like a, a, a garden or, or, or memories book, and you don't have to necessarily share it with the others. But we decided to go into the other side, which was to make the collection public. And in 2005, it was the beginning of YouTube. Mm -hmm. And so we said, wow, this is something which is changing the, also the face of the human being, is the internet. And so we decided to uh, share the collection through internet, 2005, by a website. And very quickly, we noticed that the internet was changing the human being. Slowly and slowly, we went from 2D museum to the museum, we were the first one to be in Second Life. Then in 2016, we went to VR. And uh, this year we went to, into video games and we are building a social VR platform, which is for me the future. Why it's the future? Very simply, because the human being is being transformed. Today, you know, the COVID was not the regulator of technology. And I think we speak too much of technology. We should speak of the human being. Today, you and me and everybody here, we have a digital twin. This digital twin spends between four to five hours a day on the internet. This digital twin has his own desires, his own emotions. And he will live more and more in this, what you call the virtual reality, but it's another reality. And to give you another number, which show you a little bit what, are the, um, what is the context of our time, you know, there is a generation called the alpha generation. It's the generation of the pupils born in the 21st century. And this generation, at three months, they are capable to use a smartphone to push on the buttons. At three years, they can go on Netflix. And just to give you a number, in 2025, this generation will be around 2 billion and 500 billion people. So if we want to, uh, to, I shall say, to address this new century, this new decade, we have to learn what is the metaverse and how we have to, 
I shall say how to conquer the metaverse. And naturally, to conquer the metaverse is through virtual reality museums. But also, it's through virtual reality art or digital art. And so we have to rethink, to invent new types of virtual reality museums and new types of digital art. And I think that if we just try to replicate the traditional art artwork by something called uh, digital art with a kind of hype, yeah. I shall say, name, I think we will miss something very important is the idea that we have to really create something different. And uh, the, 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 I think the, the market will be totally different. The artist will be totally different. The consumer will be totally different. The way people will use it will be totally different. But it's not just in the art. Today, you see also the fashion brands are creating that digital, I should say, accessories. Yeah. And, uh, and so I think that it's a kind of real revolution that we have to, to, to think. I don't have the keys, but what I know is that uh, for me, but it's just my intuition, the next 10 years will be very different from the last century. And if we just apply the same models, I think that we will miss something very important. I don't have this, the, the truth, but what I'm sure is that as for the collection, we are really embracing with this new vision of this metaverse. And for us today, what is important is to, I shall say, to be relevant in terms of art, in terms of the people, and not let the technology become the relevant part of the next 10 years. Because if we do something like this, we will finish like 1984. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if we, the, we have to stay human, we have to bring humanity into the middle of art, and uh, that we have to find the right ways, the right models. I'm not sure to tell you the truth, mm -hmm. uh, but it's my feeling that the scarcity model which is applied to a traditional artwork would be applied to the future of digital art. I think that digital art may, may, may perhaps follow the same thing that would happen with books, with, uh, with uh, music, music yeah. with video, videos, with newspaper. I think that at a certain time, there will be a digital distribution not based only on scarcity, but on something which is already existing. But once again, it's just an intuition. I don't have the truth, uh, but it's in this direction that nearly we have decided to work for the next 10 years. Fantastic, and uh, you've mentioned 10 years, probably it will happen uh, in five years. Yeah, the time has squeezed so much that uh, everything changes within a half year, yeah? And um, I like your idea as your collection uh, reflect, reflecting uh, an important uh, stage in time of humanity and um, that we really, we focus too much on the technologies and we're talking about digital, digital, and sometimes uh, we don't even understand what it means digital because it's a constellation of various techniques that we unite in one uh, term and um, I read in one of your interviews that you uh, buy not the artist you buy artwork precisely some particular art piece and um, how do you choose the digital art piece what is your, uh, how do you listen to your preferences? Is there any uh, criteria in choosing ones? You know, first, I think it, it's, it's important to, to define what is digital art in, in your mind and in my mind. Yeah. You know, for me, uh, uh, before this, uh, I shall say, uh, famous, uh, I shall say landmark, which was the sale of the end, Sotheby's, uh, uh, 68 million dollars NFT work, uh, a, a digital work was also something which was created by digital tools, like photography, like videos, or like installations. Okay, then after we moved to another type of definition of digital art, 
which is more linked with files and computer. So I think that we have to now, I think it's very important to be clear in what you speak or in what, you, what is for you digital art. And uh, because it's changed a lot of things in the way you, you collect it, the way you, you, you keep it and the way you show it and the way uh, and the, the future that it will have. Okay, so for me, uh, uh, I'm, I have not collected a digital art, computer art, as it is today, the understanding of what is an NFT. But I will do one very, very quickly. We, I think very quickly, we are looking at some works. We are doing our homework because I think we need to make our homework to be relevant. It's not a question of hype. It's a question of being relevant. And today we will collect an FT, FTC work as it is defined today. It will have a very strong meaning, but we are committed to look at it and to look at it as seriously as we looked at the other works. I think that once again, you will, the, the question that you are asking today, how do you praise an artwork? You know, there is always the same way for me, and I will not change the way to do it. There is the artistic, artistic value and the market value. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the, the criterion will be a little bit different. Perhaps the criterion, and especially Anastasia spoke of uh, who are, who makes the value of an artwork today, of an FTC work? Today, if you look at things uh, very clearly, it's the market and it's the social media because the institutions today have not really got into NFT. So you cannot say that NFT has an institutional validation, but it has already a validation by the public in terms of the market and in terms of the Instagram. So already you have to look at what's happening because it's important to try to understand how the market works and the market is different from the market from a traditional artwork. And it's important to understand the rules and not to try to say, I don't want to say, to look at the rules, trying to understand first. The other thing which Anastasia put on the table, which is very important for me, is this notion of copyright. Anastasia, I will be very direct with you also. You know, I have avoided uh, advisors to make my collection. I will not replace the advisors by lawyers. You know, uh, for me, either a work brings me pleasure, but if it has to bring me headache, I'm not going to get into that. And uh, with your idea of uh, copyright, I perhaps I will have a, perhaps a more uh, I don't know, other way to look at things is the idea of the fair use. You know, if I, today, if I have an artwork, physical artwork, I can show it in museums. I can put it into books and I don't have to ask to the artist every time. I have to say copyright to the artist. I have to make a reference, but I'm free to do whatever I want. If tomorrow, I want to put one of my artwork in a virtual museum. I think I will follow the same thing. Mm -hmm. I will follow. And perhaps, perhaps I will have problems. Perhaps I will have problems. Perhaps some artists will say, no, I don't want. But it's not a problem. As soon as someone says something like this for me, the work will, not, will quit the collection. Very quickly. And you know, there are many artists, there are many artworks to collect. But I think that when you do something for the artist by disseminating the artworks, by you know investing in the, like a platform like VR museums, whatever, if someone brings you problem, which for me are not really uh, relevant problems, I don't have any problem. I don't have to keep this work, and I don't have to work with this artist. There are many artists in the world. There are many artworks. So. You I respond to your question. I'm more interested by artworks, and then after naturally, I'm interested by the artist. But I think what is first important for us is what we show to the people and what can make people move in terms of being challenged or move in terms of being emotional.
that's how we move to uh, answer to your question. Yeah. Thank you. That's a very good point because uh, I know that uh, indeed the openness and the sharing are actually core principles to your collection. And I think that it's fantastic that it's not stored in, uh, uh, in some private uh, warehouses and it's, it has to be open. It's private warehouses, you know, I can really, if you No, it's, it's once again, uh, we have decided to collect huge works. And naturally, 90% of the works cannot be now open. Yeah. But what is important for me when we speak of openness? It's, it, I, I shall put the, the, the way in another way. You, you answer your question in another way. Perhaps what is interesting with what happened with the COVID is that we all have perhaps, perhaps, to rethink the metrics of success of a collection. Before the metrics of success in the art world, were based on numbers. The most important collection in terms of quantity, the most important in terms of value, the biggest museums, uh, the, the biggest people coming into the museums, it was numbers. Yeah. And I think that what is important today is perhaps to look at things differently. And for us, the metrics of success are about influential, accessibility, meaning not only the internet, but also empathy, singularity, and naturally openness. But we have to work on different types of, of uh, I shall say, of metrics of success. And when we move from the, when, and we have to move in the digital space, meaning that we learn a lot of work. Before the COVID, we have something like 10 to 15 works always low because whatever we enter into the collection can be low, but we also want to be on the digital and to apply the same, num the, the same metrics. So, so today you have to move physically and I shall say digitally in a kind of new mindset if you want to, I shall say, to be relevant for the next 10 years. True, and uh, uh, the, yeah, the relevance is uh, also, one of your main principles. And I know that uh, with your Chinese uh, contemporary art collection, you, uh, were try you've been trying to constantly keep it actual. Uh, so, uh, and uh, it was uh, growing all the time and changing a bit in time because you, sometimes you sold the works and you bought new ones to make it as up to date as possible. Are you gonna use this, uh, the same principle uh, with your new artworks? You know, it's interesting uh, because uh, for us, the SL collection is a, a cultural entrepreneurial project. Uh, it's not just about the collection, it's about the project. And we decided to conceptualize the project at the beginning. Mm -hmm. We decided to limit the collection to a certain number of works and to change 5 to 10% every year. It's like the bonsai. The more you prune, the more you can have a very strong image and you, more, you revigorate the collection. So this is the first part. The other part that you said something, and I have to add something very important, is that today the collection is no more only Dominique and Sylvain, it's also my daughter, Karen. Karen, she is part of the millennial, and she's really uh, bringing all her fresh eyes, new ideas. And this is also very important. We are moving from having to be in. And I think that if we want to, to stay relevant, also it's about an attitude. And so by conceptualizing the collection, you, you, it, it's a strong attitude that you also give to the collection. So you, we have to, it's very difficult for us, this project that uh, in a certain way, uh, this project can make, I should say, ordinary person have an extraordinary life. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just more about collecting objects. Is about how we can speak the language of our time, how we can make this collection be always re re regenerated, and how we can try to be relevant for the next 10 years. And I, I'm not sure to succeed. I'm not sure, but at least I will have a lot of fun with this collection. But I'm not sure to succeed. Perhaps <laughs> if you invite me in 10 years, or I'll tell you if I've succeeded or not. <laughs> but at this moment, uh, you know, the most difficult in life is to last, you know, yeah. and especially in the art world. We know a lot of shooting stars. Uh, so let us give us uh, 
uh, 10 years and uh, in the next 10 years, I'll, I'll tell you if we succeed. I would be happy to have this conversation in 10 years, definitely with the same uh, participants and let's have a look. And uh, Silvan, thank you so much for, you really uh, shared and it, it's a, it sounds really inspiring uh, what you're saying and it's a really practical things that I think that many people can really use uh, as a piece of advice. And uh, with the appearance of NFT market, we now see, witness the also appearance of a new type of collectors we, who uh, haven't necessarily been interested in art uh, as such. And uh, I think that's also a big change in, in the market. And um, you've mentioned so many valuable things in your approach, but uh, could you share please your ideas on what kind of advice you would give to really begin to be for the beginners in a digital art market? Where to start, how, what to do, uh, how to look at works? Um, <laughs> Here. I'm not, to tell you the truth, I'm not very good in giving recipes and in, in cooking. Uh, no, the other thing I think is that uh, once again, you know, I, 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 I perhaps because uh, I'll come back to a traditional way to look at things, you know, I've been molded by the Leo Castelli model. And so for me, uh, uh, you know, a collection is a journey. It's a journey uh, and it's not just about object. It's, I think it's a uh, it's a journey. And I think that you should apply the old way to look at art, you know, uh, uh, to look the way that uh, you enjoy what you do, you take your time, you make your homework, you know, you, you, you know, you build something. And it's not because it's about technology that you have to go very fast. I think what is important for me with the digital art and what is, I think, the most interesting thing is that the digital art has brought under the radar under the light, a new generation of artists. This generation of artists creating with computers, digital art, they were not under the radar two years ago, one year ago. Yeah. And I think it was always the usual suspects that were under the radar. And I think bringing new artists, speaking the language of their time, using the tools of their time, is already a huge victory. And so, Look at these artists, look at what they're doing, look at if they are really creative, look at they are really bringing, and no, don't look only if it's called an NFT or not an NFT. Mm -hmm. Don't look only at the market because the market is something very, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't last the market. It's ups and down. It's the favor of the day, the flavor of the day. The moment, but yeah. I really encourage you to look at the new generation of the digital art. The, the people who are creating the digital art. I really encourage you because this speaks the language of, of our time also. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvain, for sharing your, um, your insights. That's really invaluable. Thank you. It was interesting. To you. Thank you. And uh, Arseni, I want to um uh, start my conversation with you as because you've been dealing with the artists themselves and you've established your platform in 2003 so it's 20 almost 20 years ago and um how would you describe how has it changed the whole uh scene from 2003 till today you're so much into uh, also NFT. You, I know that you follow the artists and uh, not only Russian, but it's a global, uh, all global trends. So what would be your most um, sharp observations about that? I think, uh, yeah, I, I'm very pleased to, to listen to Silvan and I completely share his thoughts about this situation with art still. And I have been following the yeah, artists since, I don't know, since I remember myself at 20 years old. And so it's been developing and it's been developing very fast. And what I, what I, what I want to see, um, it's not about the artist who came into the radar right now. The, most of them has been working, have been working for 10 years or even 20 years in 
digital art and using digital tools, medium. So for me, it's not very important what, what the tool is used uh, to express the concept, uh, to express the uh, opinion that artists want to bring to the public and to his viewers, and maybe he doesn't want to bring it actually. Um, so it's most in the eye of the beholder, it's most in the eye of the viewer, how to, um, how to take this work. And um, so for me, it's, uh, I started to, to actually work with artists like 10 years ago when I start my second platform, Digital Decade. And actually, I named it Digital Decay because I wanted to reflect this uh, decay that already happened, like from 2003 to 2013. That is what it was all about the digital. It was all about the revolution in uh, technology. The iPhone came and it's totally changed the platform that we have now. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the most value, the most thing I I value in artist is communication, and this is what I really find useful when artists try to express themselves is how he can they communi communicate with people with their community with their followers with other artists and this is really important for for the whole how to say platform and I think the most friendly of them they still uh, work in this scene so I, I remember like making friends with artists so um, like 10 years ago or even 15 years ago and they still here and they really produce uh, a good art and they develop themselves so it's I think it's all about keeping sane through these uh, changing I would say changing times and everything is changing so keeping sane keeping communicative and open and yeah and friendly for mm -hmm. example and there is there is a little bit notion right now in nft market uh, when nv come when you see these prices flying over the twitter someone sell for 10 for for example for 100 ethereum another one sell for one ethereum and they become some strange situations when people start to envy when they start to be angry and this is not very how to say very healthy not healthy and, mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and what i think is just to to keep this kind of sane level in artists and and that's what i try to do it from my design collector platform and that's how i try to connect artists with themselves with other collectors with other platforms and to create collaborations together to make it more vivid to make it more life and mm -hmm. i would say especially the last year was a real challenge for everyone but maybe not for digital artists because they still work at their desks and they kind of worked before and what we see now is like an appraisal of their hard work so NFT came just in time, just to make them uh, feel proud of their work. They did, because most of them, most of them come from, I'll say, from industry, from working to the to client, from working, for, I'll say, nine to five, and spending their time to render, to create for clients, to work with um, briefs, but they don't have enough time to spend on themselves, on their own projects. And most of them feel like a fresh breeze, this market came to them and they can actually, some of them, of course, can leave it, leave the client work aside, for example, and start to work on their, what they, what they actually like. So this is really interesting time we have now. So it's kind of liberating the artists and yeah. So I can speak forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that uh, indeed uh, it's like uh, we discussed with you that it's uh, somehow also went the way as a street art, for example, it was uh, used to be kind of a, its own subculture. 
and uh, was kind of a, on the margins of the art uh, art scene. And now it comes into the galleries uh, and big exhibitions. And also, uh, many street artists become gallery artists and. Uh, I see that the, the same process is going now with digital artists and uh, um, they also uh, like a community, right? They, you, you, do they support each other somehow? I know that a few, few artists uh, mentioned that they buy NFTs from other artists. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah, that is, that's, a, that's something actually new, I think. I, I, I can't remember on the classic arts and if yeah we have this in history that some artists bought and other artists to support them mm -hmm. or not to make them hungry just to make them so survive um, but here's another situation so people started to help each other to help to promote their work and because we have these uh, kind of crypto collectors that uh, in most cases they are anonymous traders uh, came from Bitcoin era from 2017 and 2018 and they have collected some how to say stash with the money they want just to use and they found that art can be uh, the, the place where they can kind of play it, trade it and so this is kind of strange situation when you have this completely um, blocked a um, personality of um, curator of uh, sorry of collector mm -hmm. and who they are so it's only only now they became to how to say to came out and even to create their own platforms like one of the famous one is 388 and they just have no names but still they do something for the community and so that's why artists started to create this kind of feeling of uh, of the hand of the shoulder and they start to support each other and same time they start to how say to apply some rules on the community so you can't um, it's not uh, necessary to spread your work everywhere on twitter on instagram and in every comment uh, they call it shielding and it's not very good to shield your work everywhere so it's kind of this small rule start to apply and it's totally new for this, um, I would say, for this art scene. And yeah, so people that come from outside, that come from no digital, traditional, I mean, they come from traditional art, they meet this kind of strange stuff, this, uh, this new world for them. So this is kind of interesting how it's all changing and what we'll see in, I don't know, in next half year. So, for example, three months ago, it was like a wave when everything started to evolve and mm -hmm. people start to get money, actually, and they start to close their uh, problems and they start to spend their money they have to buy other artists. And this is kind of really interesting. Yeah. And yeah, so it's all about, I think, good communication and keeping this level of friendship and save each other from this kind of hate or whatever what happens on the internet yeah. bullying so yeah true and um as uh silvan mentioned yet yeah, that that there is uh, too much uh, attention to technology the technique rather than to actually the essence the core of uh, the works as uh, artworks but i think that actually for the uh, for many people who have never dealt with uh, digital art and just starting being uh, interested in it, they are just uh, examining the only the surface of uh, uh, this whole universe of the digital artists who have been actually working. They started working not. Uh, two years ago free, but uh, they were just not uh, visible. And thanks to this, uh, to NFT, it kind of fueled uh, the interest to it. And uh, uh, my other question is now when many traditional, traditional artists now um, going digital, and do you think that 
it's important the success of the artist he has offline does it matter does it guarantee his success online uh, on all these platforms does it have any connection with that um, from my perspective <laughs> Alexandra, I, you will, yeah you will also comment on that <laughs> yeah if you want yes um so i think it's uh, the the nfts the digital is not kind of art itself it's just a medium it's just a platform it's where you can express yourself so it's it's totally not connected. I mean, this question is not connected to uh, the issue that someone came from traditional art to this. It's it's absolutely uh, uh, not connected. I mean, we have a lot of examples of uh, painters that are selling well through OpenSea, through NFT platforms like Sergei Marshenko from St. Petersburg. He's very successful. He just started to spread his um, works with a number of copies, but he was actually quite famous outside on Instagram. Uh, so yeah, maybe, of course, you need to have a platform, you need to have a followers base uh, and maybe collectors, real collectors that can connect with other people. But it's kind of, uh, in most cases, is like, a, I don't know, Russian roulette. So it's like you catching a luck with this selling and then people started to see you and you started to do something uh, special for the collectors like creating physical uh, bonuses like um, sending them prints like sending them some physical works in in using nft like in certification of this physical stuff so many many artists do this and many artists start to create something physical like coins like certificates like toys uh, like i don't know 3d prints and using this kind of connection with digital and physical like digital art and you get also nft token and you get also uh, a new physical object by the post and this is really interesting how it all developing mm -hmm. and yeah it's not necessarily connected to uh, if you came from other industry because for now I see there are a few platforms for musicians they started to develop mm -hmm. and they started to use platforms to sell their audio works and music it will totally change the, the world in the next few years I think and maybe platforms like Spotify like Apple uh, should catch this um, virus and start to think about it and start to hire new people who came from NFT and how it can be applied. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of continuation of this uh, lockdown stuff when people have to have uh, have to be online because you can't go offline, for example. And everyone came there, and you have to change it. And this is kind of interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Alexandra, will you comment uh, on this uh, question? What were your ideas about that? Thank you, Arsene. It's a very long conversation, um, but if we're talking about value, I think it's really important to understand the markets you're entering when you're selling NFTs, because people who are traditional art collectors are still very, um, well, not very, they're not as much involved in collecting in this space so people you see are people who made their money through trading cryptocurrency um, that is the majority of art collectors there or people who are savvy with the technology and a very large role plays what um how active you are in that community i mean you see projects essentially being launched on twitter Twitter became the launch pad for the major auctions, uh, for the major collections, generative collections. So um, you see many celebrities coming into the space. Um, if you just look at Paris Hilton, she collaborated with an artist known in the space to sort of make, uh, make a step in. And even then she was criticized a lot that she was using her celebrity status. Mm -hmm. So. I wouldn't say if you're successful offline, you're going to magically be successful in this space. You have to build your credibility as an artist um, because it's it's about like crypto art is a 
cultural thing it's um it's not as much like a visual well it is partially visual aesthetic but it's also a part of the culture that dates back several years um so many digital artists are now um obviously entering the space and some of them are more successful than others um but those that really become part of the culture and part of the community are those um that give the confidence that they're there for the long term and that also incentivizes the collectors yeah okay thank you and um uh, there are more every day they're appearing uh, i see more and more nft platforms uh um are there nft platforms on dot art on uh, using art domain i mean yes so dot art um we've launched uh we we just celebrated our four-year anniversary uh this spring mm -hmm. and we just marked ten thousand adopters in january so dot art ever since its inception really was the hub for digital art projects. And we worked with partners like Kadaf. <laughs> we were the first sort of partner of Kadaf when it launched in New York with Arts Electronica, uh, with Rhizome 7 on 7. So you would see async.art, you would see data.art, you would see rats.art. But what's most interesting is now, especially that so many people are interested in um, uh, in NFTs. We had hundreds and hundreds of blockchain related names purchased. If you look at limited edition.art, you see a platform that's about to launch and they have seven names and each name is for a specific service. So you have kyc.art wallet.art it's absolutely incredible we just launched a partnership with a new protocol called all.art which i think um anastasia you might find interesting because they are looking into they're using the solana blockchain and they're looking at licensing and um, how do you integrate the licensing for artworks and nfts into the smart contract itself so i would say there's an incredible yeah definitely an incredible amount of projects and especially the solution that we had and we introduced um, called the digital twin also integrates all those different blockchains as part of their special fields. Um, I, I could elaborate on that maybe. Yeah. Can you, yeah. Could you tell a bit about um, this is as far as I understand this digital twin is also uh, a tool to, for the safety of copyrights, uh, right? Or is it kind of a, pre-step to NFT, to tokenization of artworks. Can you tell a little bit, a little bit about the digital twin? Um, I think it's about, it's a little bit different what Sylvain uh, meant about under digital twin. It's a real service. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. So basically digital twin is another product that we offer. Uh, you can find it on ip.art and if you, for example, register a normal domain on get.art, you would be able to build your own website and- um, As an artist, right? As an artist, as a collector, as a museum. On ip.art, um, what we really put forward is this opportunity to actually register an art object. And that could be absolutely anything. And this was sort of pre the NFT boom when, um, when we were developing this and sort of having some of the first tests uh, with different artists about it. And essentially what happens is you have the domain name system protocol and it's a database called Whois, which allows you to look up information about any website holder you have the typical fields like the name of the website holder, the email address. And what Dot .art did is we received the patent to add extra fields of information to, to this um, registration system. And once you actually go through the registration process, you can add the title of your work, you can add the medium used, the artist, the date. Mm -hmm. And um, what you generate through ip.art is a digital twin essentially a replica of your artwork and it has a standardized certificate that we host you are able to upload images and what's also interesting you're able to add a string of characters like a blockchain address mm -hmm. to that who is information field so automatically you not only create a website that hosts a certificate of your artwork you also create a smart contract in the ledger 
so it kind of like double certifies. Mm -hmm. And something that we introduced this spring is that based on the main image of that certificate, you can press a button and generate an NFT out of that um, website certificate. And we have our collection on OpenSea. And we were talking a little bit about hosting and, you know, where is your NFT hosted? And yeah. there is a very big sort of, you have R-Wave, you have IPFS, but um, there's sort of like this big argumentation that it should be on chain. And by on chain, I mean, it's actually the information is recorded on the blockchain. And this is very expensive to begin with. Like it depends uh, how much information, you know, your artwork is hosting. But you see projects like Avastars, Autoglyphs that's being auctioned right now as well. Those were some of like the first projects where all the data was on chain. Yeah. And what's interesting with the digital twin is technically the image that you upload to the digital twin is the image that's on your NFT. And if you change that image, it changes on the NFT. So you are the owner of your own hosting. So you have full control. And as an artist, if you want, you know, to transfer the work, you transfer it together with the digital certificates of the work and the person has full control of the, uh, of the piece, or perhaps as an artist, you retain the works to make sure that like the person who buys it uh, doesn't change anything. But it opens a whole new way of thinking and looking at sort of the data records that's happening online and the ways sort of you're able to certify the works. Fantastic, yeah. And uh, I wanted also to ask you how um, how do you um, value they appreciate the uh, digital artworks because uh if we talk about um nft in particular yeah it's uh, it's completely anonymous yeah and if we deal with collecting of um again traditional art we with a, a passionate collector you can always want you would always want to know something about the background of the artwork meet with the artist talk to him and uh, how we do we don't do that with nft so it has to be you have to um use some other criteria about that how what is your guidance in this field well, I would say that's partially where we did the digital certificate. So you can add, um, so with digital twin, you can actually add more fields of information as opposed to most of the platforms that are out there. And also once you register a website, it has to be a full legal name. So you're kind of like authorizing, um, you're, you're adding that extra level of security. In terms of purchasing NFTs and when it comes to like evaluating, there were obviously several scams. Some of you might have seen, like it's called, like it was lazy minting when like people would place uh, works to other wallets. To be fair, um, you can buy a fake artwork anywhere as well, right? Like how yeah. would you know? Um, but again, it comes down to who are you buying from the platforms. Mm -hmm. um, for example, you would have the Tezos based platform Hicketz Nunc and when it launched, like you couldn't even see the name of the artists. So a way for people to know that it's the right artist would go to their Twitter account and see that the artist has posted the link to the artwork he's selling. Okay. I know it sounds a little bit primitive, but uh, you know, we all have to do our due diligence. And I'm sure when Sotheby's is selling, uh, well, by the time this is released the sale the sale would have happened mm -hmm. but when, when sort of when Sotheby's and Christie's are preparing for their auction they have a whole set of documentation that they, pro they provide and they work with partners who are ensuring the you know the best quality uh, in terms of hosting and in terms of the the tokens uh, the tokens used so I would also say for people who are new to this to go through, cons there, are, there are tons of people advising, um, tons of people willing to help and advise on um, what type of works are, are better to collect, uh, what type of things, you know, it's important to look at. Uh, so just be mindful because many people jump on a hype and buy things because they think it's you know it's hot or they won some lottery by being the first and it turns out it was a fake account and it's yeah. it's unfortunate but it happens and it happens not only online and but offline as well so it's you know as uh Sirvan mentioned do your homework as a collector yeah. you have to do your homework um thank you very much guys for this conversation my last question is 
uh, because I think that uh, this conversation was also useful for you as well. I hope that you learned something um, for yourself. And my last question is actually if you have questions to each other, um, maybe. <laughs> Before we finish, no. Personally, um, I think it's a it's a very challenging time. I think that uh, uh, you know uh, I speak as a colleague, as someone who has always been you know involved in the art world, but uh, perhaps in in a very traditional way. But I think that we have to change our mindset uh, to look at things. Uh, differently and i was really amazed by all what has been said today really for me it's uh it's part of my homework uh and I, I really have to to you know to be very humble and when you when you you know you have to really understand that the world is changing that the digital art will stay in one way or another uh that there will be a special market for that there will be special artistic value for that uh, and so uh, it's not hype. I don't think it's hype. It's part of our new world. It's part of the metaverse. Because what are you going to put in the metaverse, in the museums, in the, in the spaces in the uh, metaverse? You're not just going to put the scan or the image of an artwork, but you will put really work co created for this new world and for this new generation. So I think that what all you're doing, all this, all together, you're doing is very, uh, very important. And uh, uh, I think it's great to, to give the voice to, to, all, to all of you and to, uh, because I think it's, uh, it's important for the people to understand that it's not just hype, but uh, it's, it's part also of what we have to look at. Thank you so much. And uh, that's why I recommend again that, uh, uh, everyone visits uh, Pending Futures and also Cut Off Online uh, just for some, uh, which provides some image of uh, the future trends in art and what we can expect because we feature the youngest generation of artists. And I think that it's a little bit of projection of what can, where we can expect in uh, 10 years, as you say, Silvano, maybe even earlier. So thank you very much, uh, dear participants. It was fantastic and enjoyable conversation. And uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs>